Hello, I'm Lucy and my research looked at the school experiences of autistic girls who were diagnosed during their adolescent years. So um, this came from SENCOs during my second year of training, raising concerns about growing numbers of girls in their school showing signs or what they thought was undiagnosed autism, stemming from social, emotional and mental health concerns. There is no current research looking at the school experiences of autistic girls diagnosed during their adolescent years using the voices of the young people themselves and their parents and carers. There is emerging research on educational experiences of um, female autistic adolescents. Um, and I found two studies, one was Froston who looked at school experiences and exclu exclusion using the views. Um, and more recently, Moyes, who used creative methods to gather their views. So we know that research about autistic girls and their experiences is a priority, and this has been highlighted by the autism community, as there are negative educational outcomes for autistic girls. So um, we know that historically, autism support and research has been conceptualised from a predominantly male perspective, and there are several barriers to girls getting a diagnosis. It's traditionally later than boys, it can be lengthy, and it's not straightforward. And um, we know that school can be a very challenging place um, for autistic children and young people in general. And understanding of presentation and awareness of female autism in schools can be very scarce. So, my research questions were looking at from the perspective of the girls and their parents, but very much it was focused on the girls' voices and the parents supporting that, and you'll see that in the themes. Um, so what was the girls' overall experience of school and school support like? What worked well? What improvements could be made? And what did this change? And what was the girls' pathway to autism diagnosis during these adolescent years? And how did the school, if they did, support this? And what worked well and where could improvements be made? So I used a multi-informant approach. In total, I was quite surprised. I had 64 girls express interest. Um, but after lots of follow-up um, and different reasons why some girls chose to not participate, the final sample was 13. Now, this included eight autistic girls and um, five parents. So half of the girls' parents participated because one of these was a couple um, and two mothers and a father, and which was positive there was a father participating on his own because a lot of the research, again, is from mothers' perspectives. Um, so all the, the, the inclusion criteria was that the, um, the girl had to be aged between 16 and 25. She'd attended school in the UK. And um, this was really important to me was that I took steps towards a participatory approach. So I was lucky to partner with the Autistic Girls Network. Um, and the CEO herself is neurodivergent. She has neurodivergent children. So her and I worked together in sort of co-constructing the project. So I run everything sort of by her before I sort of went ahead with things and we discussed things, we looked at the literature and sort of this all came from the gaps. Um, it was very important that the project was guided by the priorities of the autistic community. So um, yeah, there was, it, it, it obviously was time limited as we know for our thesis, but in an ideal world I would have developed sort of a panel and could have had input from autistic people. but. Um, Kathy's input was invaluable. So I um, used um, positive methodology, I used semi-structured interviews, but I also used a personal construct psychology tool, which we're all aware of, the ideal and non-ideal school, um, which allowed the girls to reflect and draw before meeting with me for um, the interview. And I used um, reflexive thematic analysis to analyze the data. Um, now, um, I also, um, so in order to ensure the participants felt comfortable, I sent in advance my one-page profile. I gave them the choice. This is something Kathy and I came up with, that they could choose whether they wanted to be interviewed by me, filmed and interviewed by their parent carer, or write the interviews. And um, half of them decided they really wanted to be interviewed by me. The other half wrote it, and none of them wanted to be interviewed by their parent or carer. But positive to give them that choice. 
Um, and here are my results. So um, there were four main themes and five sub-themes, and um, one parent sub-theme um, which, which came out, so supporting, again, what the girls had communicated. Um, oh, sorry, Vicky. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, theme one, um, so this included the girls' reflections on how the school environment, so the school grounds, the classrooms, played such a crucial role in how they felt and could be ready to learn. Um, they emphasised that it was the physical environment that they struggled with. It wasn't the actual work. So this was this really came out very strongly. Um, and um, the sub theme um, around managing these negative sensory environments. So this was around things like proximity to people in the classrooms, how they wanted desks to be, um, how the bright lights of the projector affected them and then disrupted their entire day of learning. Um, and sort of sensitivities to noise in the room, the classroom door being open, all these types of things just completely threw them off for their entire day and they couldn't be ready to learn. Um, theme two included the girls' and parents' reflections on their relationships with their peers and school staff. Um, and what came out very strongly was how challenging social aspects of school were, now, what was interesting was in the literature, this tended to be focused for autistic girls around secondary school only, but for my sample, this was throughout primary and secondary. Um, they just felt generally very misunderstood. There was bullying. Um, they felt isolated due to um, mental, their, their mental health decline. Um, and parents reflected on how their daughters never had a peer or friend the same age as them, so it was always younger, older, or someone who was neurodivergent, so they would never play or have friendships in, in the same year group, which I found was quite interesting from a teacher perspective to observe that, and then perhaps that be a flag or something you need to look at further. Um, they discussed challenges for um, the unpredictability of schools, so um, in secondary school, the teacher suddenly saying, right, we're going to have a science lesson in the English room today, and how that would completely throw out their entire day of learning, and it was just very simple to the teacher to, to say that. Um, or um, the fact that substitute teachers, or those types of changes. Um, and also behaviour management, so teachers that were very punitive, or teachers that would be having sort of up and down personalities. Um, and, um, yeah, they, and then individualisation, so um, not having personalised learning, so simply verbal, and written instructions, not catering to auditory processing needs. Um, the third theme was about the journey to diagnosis, so, and this did not come at all from school. So school did not have any input on this. I think that was, yeah, quite eye-opening. But um, there was no, this came from either parents or from CAMS, so their referrals to CAMS through their mental health decline. Um, so on reflection of this, the girls described sort of the journey of feeling very misunderstood, um, early years, sort of separation anxiety challenges in those real early years, and then mental health just declining across those, those school years, referring to CAMS, being sent through like CBT programs and lots of different therapies, not feeling any of them fit, and then finally CAMS came back and oh, maybe we should look at autism. So it was just these really long, complicated journeys. Um, and the girls felt very frustrated by that, that people didn't understand them. And the parents also said about the fact that the school tended to always look at their external presentation and not their internal presentation. So they were, most of the sample were quite academic. And therefore, this was just bypassed, their internal presentations. The final theme was um, around um, the transition of adapting to their to their new identity, their um, autism diagnosis, and frustration at responses that they received when they got that diagnosis. So, for example, you can see Alice there, it's a pseudonym. Um, she was talking about how you know this teacher's known her since year seven, and was just completely shocked. And everyone around them was shocked, and they just didn't feel that was supportive. And they returned to school, and there wasn't support in place. Um, so limited post-diagnosis diagnosis support. Um, and the girls and parents discussed, because some of them obviously are in college or university now, and how they felt a lot more supportive in those environments versus school. And lastly, um, about how advocation is very important to them. And um, they felt very strongly about 
being the ones giving training at schools, so actually being the autistic person standing up and doing the training. Um, and a lot of them were sort of trying to, to um, yeah, work with local authorities and trying to, to do things like that, which I thought was amazing. Um, so now I see the EP implications. So um, I conceptualise these using um, Bronf and Brenner's um, bioecological model. Um, and as EPs, it's important that we're working alongside SENCOs to ensure early identification. Girls aren't slipping under the radar. These red flags are identified. So in terms of the person, um, I think for me this linked to the individualisation aspect. So the fact that the girls felt that if the school staff had got to know them individually, they would have under understood them and their needs, and then they would have had an overall better learning experience and been ready to learn. And I guess this finding translates to the fact that they felt misunderstood and the diagnosis didn't come from school supporting them or EP involvement. Um, and I also providing during our consultations with schools, we can provide them with the white paper, which is um, online, free to, to find from in, on the Autistic Girls Network website. And there's checklists in there that we can provide SENCOs, perhaps to sort of flag things. Um, providing training, um, but with perhaps with autistic people, as they highlighted, that the autistic girls should be a part of that training. Um, and um, a final reflection on the context, we need to be involved at all levels. We support girls and families um, at the micro and the meso system, but we need to consider the macro, the ecosystem, using multi-agency working, conducting research, teacher training, so this is what we need to look forward to in the future. Um, and um, I did, in my thesis, I did provide the girls' own recommendations to really centralise their voice. So this was my sort of analysis of it, but they gave their own um, recommendations. So I hopefully that will sort of translate into something that I can take into consultation to be thinking of those things.